Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Before I start, I just want to give a couple very quick thank yous uh, to the CSIS uh, for their incredible hospitality having us here today. Uh, obviously, our three judges, Mr. Banks, Mr. Siegel, Mr. Lawler, for taking the time out of their schedule to come watch and give us comments. Uh, to the audience, everyone who showed up, it's great to have a, a large crowd here, um, and hopefully you'll enjoy. To Dr. Hamry and Ms. Meacham for introducing the debate, and for Eli Jacobs, of course, for setting this all up, um, as well as all the sponsors for providing necessary funding. So without further ado, let's get underway. In this debate, me and my partner, Andrew Arsh, will argue that the DOD should take a first mover role and purchase small modular reactors for its domestic bases in the United States. A small modular reactor, or SMR, is a nuclear reactor which produces less than 300 megawatts of electricity. Now, reactors now, a large light water reactor, usually produces between maybe 1,000 to 1,200 megawatts. So we're talking about a three to four fold reduction in output with a corresponding decrease in size, water consumption, fuel, etc. Now, as some of you may have heard, the Department of Energy recently gave out $500 million in loans to develop SMRs in Georgia. But the existing package is going to prove vastly insufficient to create a new nuclear industry in the United States for two reasons. First, the cost of achieving approval from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for a commercial SMR is estimated to be about $2 billion. The existing loan package is not nearly enough to create an SMR hooked up to the grid, even if it creates a demonstration. Second, is that the DOE as an institution lacks the market pull and the experience commercializing new technologies in order to get an industry off the ground. The DOD, however, can solve these shortfalls. Jeffrey Marcuse, who's the executive director of the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program at DOD, explains in 2012, reasons for past failures at DOE are lack of a market within DOE, a disconnect between business practices at DOE, and commercial practices, since DOE is neither the ultimate supplier nor the ultimate buyer of these technologies, there are challenges in creating a system that can bring technologies across the valley of death. DOD's market size, however, allows it to play a critical role that can overcome these challenges. So why pursue SMRs? We think there are many reasons, but we'll be brief and isolate two. First is non-proliferation. SMRs create a strong nuclear export market that will strengthen the domestic nuclear industrial base, which is critical to US leverage over the international fuel cycle. CSIS's very own Michael Wallace and Sarah Williams write in 2012, America's nuclear energy industry is in decline. China, India, Russia, and other countries are looking to significantly expand their nuclear commitments. 15 new nations could have this tech within the next two decades. America's ability to exert leadership is directly linked to the strength of our domestic industry. In the past, the US provided a model for industry self-regulation. The results were not perfect, but America's institutional support for global nonproliferation helped shape the way nuclear tech was adopted and used. This influence seems to be certain to wane if the US is no longer a major supplier or user of nuclear tech. Second, SMRs will insulate DOD bases from grid vulnerability, which is a growing risk to effective operations and command infrastructure in the United States. George Robitaille, who is a civilian working on the Army's strategy research report, wrote in 2012, the Department of Defense depends on electricity at military facilities, which are controlled by a public grid, which is susceptible to age of infrastructure, natural disasters, and cyber attacks. The DOD, in fact, gets 99% of their electrical requirements from the public grid. Components, however, are over 100 years old. Admiral Blair, the former director of national intelligence, testified before Congress that uh, the growing connectivity of our grid creates opportunities for attackers. SMRs, however, are able to provide a secure and independent source of electricity in the event that the public grid is compromised. Now, one concern raised by critics of SMRs is cost. Can they compete? We think they can. Ionis Kessides and Vladimir Kutsasov from the World Bank explained in 2012, 
SMRs overcome key barriers that have inhibited the growth of nuclear power. They have smaller size, lower power, and simpler design, which allow for greater modularization of units, standardization, and fabrication. SMRs can benefit from the economies of multiples that accrue to mass production of components in a factory. Building reactors in a series instead of individually can lead to significant per unit cost reductions. Another concern is safety, and we think there are two important things to note. First, the sum total of life-threatening injuries or deaths that have resulted from commercial nuclear accidents in the United States is zero, ever, which is far less than casualties from industrial accidents associated with any other energy source. Second, SMRs incorporate new passive safety features which prevent accidents. Robert Rosner, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago and the former director of the Argonne National Laboratory explains in 2011, that SMR designs incorporate passive safety features that utilize gravity-driven or natural convection systems. SMRs have a much lower level of heat decay and require less cooling after reactor shutdown. Designs eliminate the need for backup. They improve seismic capability. They provide large and robust underground pool storage for waste. These designs present a strong safety case for SMRs. Thank you. So you mentioned NRC hurdles as a key barrier to the current DOE SMR development. What does a DOD first mover role do to avoid that concern? Uh, I mean, I guess I would say two things. First is that the NRC has to license small modular reactors no matter what. Now that process isn't much different from licensing existing light water reactors. And we believe since that they're safer, smaller, easier to construct, that that's a relatively painless process. But second, the DOD, as a multiple decade user of nuclear fuel for nuclear submarines, for example, has a working relationship with the NRC that's far stronger than the DOE does. That's fair. Um, how long do you believe, or does the Wallace and Williams expert evidence discuss for developing a robust domestic commercial nuclear base in order to gain international leverage? Yeah, that's a great question, Arjun. Uh, a few things. The designs for SMRs have already been drawn up. So we know how to build them. We know what they look like. We largely know how they'll work. There have been demonstrations before. The Navy has built them, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, obviously, it's not a quick process, though. You know, you need to get SMR factories up and running. You need to get the DOD to first purchase technology, then disseminate it to the private sector. We would say, you know, maybe a decade, maybe two. But there's an important signal that we think even just the initial act of revitalizing nuclear would have for people who might be concerned about proliferation risks that I think we should also be aware of. Sure. And then in the context of that, you talk about kind of the small scale civilian efforts that are happening. Sure. Why aren't those the sufficient signal or starting point for SMRs that sure. your evidence discusses? Well, I think, you know, we outlined that in the beginning. Um, the DOE allocated about 500 million to the Savannah River test site in Georgia for small modular reactors. And that is definitely sufficient or maybe sufficient to create a demonstration project. So we'll build an SMR, it will run, it will work, uh, but is it enough to overcome the licensing hurdles to construct multiple? We don't think so. And the piece of evidence we read from the Marcuse study uh, says that the DOD has unique connections with industry. So if the DOE acts as a test bed, they're like, we'll build this SMR. The industry thinks the DOE is incredible. They think the DOE won't purchase from them if they decide to create their own SMR units. And the DOD, by contrast, regularly purchases from the private sector. And it regularly engages with those private sector contractors. Uh, so there's a more credible signal of commitment from okay. the DOD than the DOE. Last question. Uh, you talk about grid vulnerabilities. If it truly has been so vulnerable and in urgent need of repair since the 2008 Defense Science Board report that your evidence cites, how can you account for the absence of an effective attack or total shutdown? Uh, I think, so part of the piece of evidence by Robitaille in that study talks about how there have been probes onto the U.S. grid by hackers, uh, perhaps from China, Russia, or non-state actors. So the risk is sort of increasing. Plus, we know from 03 how vulnerable the grid is. And sorry, I won't go any more over yeah. time. Okay. Thank you.